thank you so much for speaking with me today. I, I saw the film this afternoon and was just floored by it. Um, I, I heard that there, your first cut of the film was, was much longer than the two hour cut. Is that true or? No, that's not no? True. Okay. Uh, my previous film, the first cut was over four hours. No, this one was pretty close. This one was, the first cut was, I want to say two hours and five minutes, which is not so bad. You know, the movie, the final cut is about an hour of 50. So, and then with credits, you know, it becomes two hours. So, so I, I would say it's about 15 minutes longer, something like that. Not bad. I so one of the things that really sort of jumped out at me at this film, or you have this sort of, it's a very cerebral, emotionally driven story, but then occasionally you'll get this sort of violent set piece. And I was kind of curious about the construction of those set pieces, because they sort of tell kind of like a history of violence in their own way. Yeah, we, we had intended the thing to be almost like broad and subtle, you know, that the thing would have moments of introspection and then there would be explosion, explosions and then introspection and explosions and that sort of thing would keep you on your toes and allow you to delve even more deeply into the stuff that was very introspective. It was all part of the design, really. And we were trying to say, space doesn't really want us out there. It's hostile to us because it's indifferent to us. And we thought part of the way to show that was a kind of explosiveness. No, that, that alienation and loneliness really sort of seeps through in, in the film and really sort of envelops you. I was curious sort of, you know, with your approach to shooting it, and especially trying to shoot in that sort of zero-G like environment, what are the challenges in trying to, to make that believable? It's the biggest pain in the rear you could possibly <laughs> imagine. I don't know how Alfonso Cuaron did it for gravity. I think he did it with digi doubles and you know putting faces on digi doubles so that is a remarkable achievement i don't know how he kept his sanity it's incredible um we tried to do it in a little bit more of a kind of um i don't want to say primitive way but we tried to conjure the the methods of kubrick for example and what he did was and what we did was we built two versions of the sets a horizontal version and a vertical version same set and you would do the close-ups in the horizontal and then when you needed to be zero gravity Brad would hang from wires, and we would shoot with the camera looking up at him as he was hanging. And it's pretty convincing as zero G, but it is not what you want to be doing all day. Uh, you know, it, it, even though it, you know, gravity is its own thing, I was completely sold <laughs> on all the zero G stuff. I was also sort of curious about your use of close-up in this film and how, how well it tells the story and sort of brings us into McBride's sort of psyche. Well, the close-up is one of the great weapons in the history of the cinema. I mean... I don't know who invented it. Maybe it was Edwin Porter, great train robber. I don't know, it's hard to know. But you imagine the first person who I ever used a movie camera, they thought, oh, I'm going to give you this. Where's the rest of the body? Whoever discovered this understood that the actor can reveal much more about him or herself by saying nothing at all in the cinema because the, the camera sees right through you in a close-up. That's a weapon. We know we can understand emotionally what the camera's going through, the actor, actor's going through when the camera's really close. Okay. It's a beautiful thing. You mentioned Kubrick, and it's funny because I watching this film like this is 2001 meets Apocalypse Now, and it was just. What, were those some of your inspirations for this film? Uh, it was, but you know the funny thing is I'm going to say something very pretentious here. Um, our first uh, inspiration, we tried to do the Odyssey from Telemachus's point of view. You know, Odysseus goes away for 20 years and he has to go hunt for... We, but, you know, the movie becomes something different. And then the, two, the, start, the, the 2001 and the Apocalypse Now mashup idea, which I now cop to completely, um, really is because the Kubrick film adheres to an authentic view of space travel. And Apocalypse has that kind of mythic heart of darkness thread. And so if you put those two together, I guess you got this. But this sort of, I would say, you know, has, I don't want to say you've, you've edged out Apocalypse Now, but I did like that there's an emotional connection between, you know, your Willard and your Kurtz. Well, that is a big difference in the story. I mean, Kurtz is a symbolic father in Apocalypse Now, and here it's his actual father. We were trying to do something very mythic. Uh, we were trying to conjure a story of father and son, and we thought that the tenderness... I mean, could only be achieved by that biological relationship. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. I, I loved the film, and well, just you. congratulations thank on you. it.